Okay, we're continuing with the road to World War II. Hopefully we're getting near the end of this one. I know it's been kind of long, but there's a lot going on. Uh, and when I left you with the last video, we had an increasingly tense situation in the Atlantic between the Germans and the Americans. And it seems very likely that this situation will escalate and possibly bring the U.S. into a war with Germany. It really seems inevitable. After the sinking of Reuben James, uh, that something else will happen and we will end up going to war with Germany. But guess what? There's a whole other half of the planet that we tend to forget about, and that's over in the Pacific area in Asia. So, what we'll see, we're going to go back a little bit. Uh, the move towards war with Japan. Okay. Now, the Japanese have been continuing their war against the Chinese that they had started in 1937. Uh, but they'll also, you know, that's kind of bogging down a little bit. Now, the Japanese military is much more efficient than the Chinese military. Uh, but China is a really big place, and it's got a lot of people in it. So even though the Japanese are you know, doing well, it's just it's like eating an elephant, right? And it's just huge. Right? And so they're kind of maybe getting bogged down a bit in China, and they have their eyes set on other places. The Japanese would like to establish what they call the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Okay? Uh, kind of like a common market uh, trading partners, Asia for Asians. Get all the European Western Imperial Powers out of Asia and let the Asians run Asia. Okay? Now, just one thing, the Japanese, you've got to have a hierarchy, right? Somebody's got to be in charge, and the Japanese see themselves as being the leader of this uh, Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. They'll, they'll call the shots, thank you very much. And they will continue to try to expand uh, as we move into 1940. Now, a couple of things will happen in 1940. Okay? One, about halfway through the year, maybe, no, okay. About halfway through the year, uh, May, I think it was, the United States Pacific Fleet, which is normally based at uh, San Diego, California, moves out to take up station at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Now, Pearl Harbor had been a naval base for, for years and years and years. It had facilities. It's like a forward operating base. But the, the fleet itself actually was based out of San Diego. You know, ships on maneuvers could pull into Pearl Harbor and you know, I mean, there's ships working there, I'm sure. But the main fleet actually moves out to Pearl Harbor in 1940. The idea here is to get it closer to the scene of any trouble. Okay? If you go from San Diego to Pearl Harbor, you're a 1,000, 1,500 miles closer to any potential problems. Might help to tear the Japanese uh, from doing anything. Or if you have to, you know, if you do have to intercede in some kind of situation to put you closer to the scene of action. So that happens in 1940. Something more important uh, for our story is that the Japanese will seize uh, part of French Indochina. Let me get my pen here. Okay. They go to Hanoi. This is Hanoi. Right here. See, here's China. This area here is known as French Indochina. It's a colony. Okay. The French have been there for some time. You know, they've done missionary work, of course. Uh, this is where there's a Michelin Tire Company. This is where a lot of their rubber plantations are. Okay. And uh, they think, what's going on in 1940 with France? Oh, that's right. They'd surrendered to the Germans in June. And so the French military strength has been greatly reduced, of course. Uh, and they're preoccupied with the situation that their country is, you know, occupied by the Germans. At least half of it is. Uh, and so the Japanese kind of waltz into Hanoi, say, hi, we're here, we're kind of taking over. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, any of the particulars on this. It wasn't like, you know, battles or anything. I think they just kind of, like, moved in, saying, here we are, if you don't like it, you can leave. And this happens in 1940 as well. Now, Roosevelt, I told you, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, 
very much sees Germany as a threat, and he's working on trying to get the American public to start to see Germany as a threat and finding try, trying to find ways to help Great Britain uh, hold off against the Germans. His game in J against Japan is to stall for time and try to use diplomacy. And he doesn't think we can you know, really try to tackle everything at once. So we're trying to work with the Japanese. We're trying to influence their behavior. Uh, and so as the Japanese are doing these various things, we're putting diplomatic pressure on them. Uh, we're cutting off some supplies to them. Uh, I'm a little hazy on the exact details because they kind of go in stages. You know, first we try this, and then we try that. And so it's not really important. Just know he's putting economic pressure on the Japanese to try to get them to you know, stop doing nefarious things. Okay? All right. Next slide. Uh, let's not really worry about this map right at the moment. Uh, it's just a map of the Pacific. Here's the Hawaiian Islands, though. That's good. This is here's Hawaii right here, okay. And uh, here's the Philippines, American possession. And don't worry about this red squiggly line uh, around uh, everything. That really goes something happens later, okay. All right. In uh, September. Uh, I believe it was, the Japanese signed what's called the Tripartite Pact. I might be mispronouncing this. This is a pact with Germany and Italy. Okay, They become allied with each other. Okay, uh, I think I've got a quote from it here. Let's see. Yes, here it is. All right. This is September 1940. Uh, you can read this. Okay, the governments of Germany, Italy, and Japan, considering it as a condition precedent of any lasting peace that all nations of the world, given its own proper place, yada 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 yada. Furthermore, it is the desire of these three governments to extend cooperation with such nations as other spheres of the world, blah blah blah, in order that their ultimate aspirations for world peace may thus be realized. You can read this yourself. Okay. Because, you know, Mr. Hitler and Mr. Mussolini are all about the peace. Okay? But what they're saying, look at this, if they maintain, maintain a new order of things calculated to promote mutual prosperity. Okay? The Germans and the Italians and the Japanese, you know, they see the, the British have a worldwide empire, the French had had an empire, although they've now been defeated by the Germans and you know, have tenuous control of it. Okay? And they think it's, you know, they do their share, okay? And so, with this tripartite pact, establishes what's usually known as the Axis powers, A-X-I-S. Now, this, I think the term actually goes back before the, before the three-way pact. Uh, the Germans and the Italians were saying, you know, the, the world used to revolve on an Axis that went through, you know, London or wherever. I don't know, you know. But now it's going to go on an axis that goes through Germany and Rome. Berlin and Rome. Okay. There, the time, as, as uh, Bob Dylan said, the times, they are changing. The Germans and the Japanese and Italians think it's you know, time for them to have their moment in the limelight. And so this is in September of 1940. Okay. This is a mutual... You know, defense pact, okay? Uh, they would be allied against any outside aggressors. Now, the U.S. is continuing, as I said, to try to work on Japan with diplomatic means, okay? There's been a series of negotiations. We're trying to get them to stop messing around in China, to stop invading French Indochina. Uh, these sorts of things. We're not having any luck. In 1941, 
Japanese move into Saigon. And gosh, I wish I had that map. It was back there a couple of slides ago, but like I said, if I try to go back, it'll screw up the narration. But Saigon is down in the south part of French Indochina. But if you go back and look on the map, it's not there. It's in, it says Ho Chi Minh City, but that's Saigon. Okay. So the Japanese have now moved farther south and gobbled up some more French Indochina. Okay. Here's where Roosevelt will basically pull out all the stops. He throws everything he's got left of the Japanese. He stops selling them uh, you know, oil. They get a lot of their oil from us. Scrap metal. Remember, Japan is an island. They don't have a lot of resources. So we sell them scrap metal that they can use to make into new steel. They get you know, gasoline and uh, oil from us. Uh, of course, aviation gasoline can be used to prosecute for war against the Chinese. And so Roosevelt, you know, shuts off the flows of all these things at some point. Don't ask me the exact date. I don't know. Uh, he also freezes Japanese assets in the United States. So money that belongs to Japanese, the Japanese government, the Japanese businesses, or Japanese individuals that's in the United States and investments and holdings is frozen where they can't get access to it. Roosevelt's trying to open up you know, a can of economic war pass on the Japanese, hoping to get them to straighten up and fly right. Okay. Now, I told you to think about unintended consequences when we study history. Roosevelt's hoping to put pressure on the Japanese to get them to stop their aggressive you know, seizures and you know, attacks against China, etc., etc. What he inadvertently probably ends up doing is there's only a finite amount of oil and aviation gas and you know, resources stored in Japan. When Roosevelt stops sending these kind of things to Japan, or selling these kind of things to Japan, the Japanese military, which is very, very, very influential. Now, the Japanese, Japanese government is not a dictatorship like you have in Germany. It's got, they've got an emperor, they've got like a parliament, it's called the Diet. Uh, but the J Japanese military is very influential, and they're calling a lot of the shots as far as foreign policy. And they realize, hey, if the Americans have cut off the flow of materials, we better go find some more. Right? Because at some point, we won't have enough oil, gas, steel, whatever, to continue to you know, do what we need to do. So it's like, it starts a stopwatch. We have this much material on hand. If we can't get a diplomatic solution, we're going to have to come up with some other solution. Meanwhile, though, uh, there's this continued attempt to try to work something out. Okay, so up there on the outline it says final deadlock, October to December 1941. Uh, things are starting to tick away. The military is already making plans, but they will continue to try to work things out diplomatically. Okay, we have room for one more slide here. Ah. Oh. There's the ever map. Okay, the map of French Indochina is here again. All right. Here's Ho Chi Minh City, which back then was called Saigon. All right. And I accidentally clicked to this guy. All right. The Japanese have a new prime minister. He's a military officer. He's a general. General Tojo. Don't ask me his first name. Uh, now, if you're putting a general in as prime minister, does that suggest that the military is very, 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 very influential in Japan? Yes, it does. It's almost like we might be getting ready to, you know, to do military-type action. But the Japanese diplomats aren't going to give up. They send an extra diplomat to the United States. There's already a dip an ambassador here. They send a second prestigious ambassador. And these two men are trying to negotiate something with the Americans. Okay? Trying to get Roosevelt to back off on the economic sanctions. Okay? But uh, they've been told there's a timeline. They need to have some kind of settlement worked out by November, the end of November, or things are going to start to happen. Okay? Now, they don't know what these things are. They just know that there's a deadline. Of course, what we want them to do is get out of China. What they want us to do is turn on the supplies, 
and it's not going to happen. And I'm out of time. We'll have to do one last segment.